started. Um, thank you to those who are continuing to come despite it being the end of the semester in a research class. I know that's a thing people tend to do. It's like the very first thing that people stop doing when they're busy. Uh, so I appreciate it. Man, this, what did they put in this? <laughs> we'll let that settle for a minute. Uh, right, so welcome to your third to last class and second to last lecture. Uh, I think the only stuff that you guys have left is your, your project. Um, and I've, saw, I've seen a lot of them. I saw it yesterday and, and other times, and you guys are, are doing all right. Uh, are there any questions about procedural stuff? Yeah, so there's a, a few reminders. Uh, I wish I posted this spreadsheet where you can sign up for Time to Talk. Um, you should, like, do that. And, 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 and put in that spreadsheet a link to your, your slides, right? So we're going we're gonna to try and be as efficient as possible. I, I don't like to be that guy with like a buzzer and a gong and have a bunch of shtick, but like, well, whatever we have to do to get you off the stage and, and run for the next guy, I'll do. Because I, I really, still, I, I really, uh, I, 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 don't, uh, I, I don't want you guys to run like this, because you actually have ample time to talk, it's at five to eight minutes, and it's okay to be on the five end, by the way. So in terms of your write-ups, uh, please remember that I gave you guys a particular format to use, and uh, if you look in the course project instructions, it's right there on the course web page. It's a very specific kind of like list of sections. I noticed in the course of the project check-ins, people didn't really look at the instructions very carefully, and you know you should you should do that because this is a requirement. Uh, yeah. Um, are there any any questions about the project stuff we have left? Uh, one person uh, asked if you have to stay for the additional times because you can't quite fit them all the lecture. The answer is no, but of course. Actually, you guys are doing really interesting stuff for your projects, and, and uh, I you know, encourage you to stick around, and, and you might find something. Uh, and regardless, I will be here, so my, my apologies to whoever's last, because I'm imagining you're going to, given the attrition rate that I'm experiencing, I'm you, you, you may have fewer than 100% of the students in, uh, listening to your talk, so I will let you choose your talk slot accordingly, whether you prefer that or would like to communicate the research with the larger audience. But one way or the other, um, yeah, do sign up for a time, do post a link to your slides, do get ready. If you show up in my office hours next Wednesday and you don't have any deliverables for your project and you really have this last minute, oh my god, I need you to help me debug my code, my answer will be no. Cool? So if you are in that stage now, that's actually, it's not great, but it's okay. Contact me and we'll find a time and we'll sit down and we'll debug. I, I'm actually even on campus this weekend if we have to. We'll find something to get you to a point where you have a nice stable monthly project. But if you show up the day before it's due, and that's, and that's where you're at, uh, then we're going to have a different conversation. Um, incidentally, uh, you, you cannot use your late days for this class on the course project. So if you haven't used them already, tough cookies, because there's nothing else left. Okay. Uh, right, so if there are no questions, then we'll, we'll like, talk about math, which is way more interesting than this time. So, uh, if you recall, uh, in, our, in our last lecture, essentially, what we, what we introduced was this idea of Correspondence, right? And, and the big idea in correspondence was that I'm given two pieces of geometry, and, and depending on the algorithm, when we say geometry can mean a slightly different thing, right? Like it might mean a surface, or it might mean, in the case of like GMDS, it might just be metric space. But you have some expression of a shape, and your goal is given two of these things to kind of map one onto the other. Right? And the difference between this and registration was that here we're really trying to minimize distortion, but the distortion might be large. Whereas in registration, you really do expect that you can just kind of stick stuff on top of each other and, and maybe just locally perturb stuff to, to get a reasonable map. Right? So that was our setup. And essentially what we set up last time was this whole spectrum of different options for correspondence. And the basic trade-off here was that the fewer assumptions that you put on your piece of geometry, the more expense you expect to put into your, 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 your computation. And that, that, that basically makes sense, right? If you have really, really strong structure, then it shouldn't be that hard to match the structure onto another one. If you just have weak assumption, like I'm given two shapes and they're totally different and different topology, whatever, then correspondence is going to be quite hard because you, you, you're searching in very large space of all the possible ways to kind of warp one guy into the other, right? Um, and so on the left hand side, remember we introduced a couple algorithms like uh, Gromov, uh, Gromov Hausdorff distance and Gromov Wasserstein. Uh, where you have this very generic objective, but unfortunately it's going to be hard to optimize. And then on the right hand side, we have things like this one point matching uh, with the heat kernel, where literally one point correspondence was enough and you could just kind of read off the map. But the second that you deviate from isometry, you, you, you can't use that tool. And so this whole spectrum, this is like no single right answer here, sadly. 
And, and the question we left off with last time was, well, like, what's in between? You know, what's a, a reasonable assumption that I can make, maybe just on the surface corresponds to one, that makes it easy enough that I expect to solve it in a tractable way that at least is not going to be hard, uh, but wide enough that the space of maps that I'm searching in, like, will have a solution, right? So, for instance, if I have, you know, a horse and a giraffe, our favorite example here, and ask for an isometry from one of the next, and my algorithm is searching for an isometry, my algorithm is never going to converge, it's going to give me garbage, right? Because an assumption just doesn't exist. Uh, so, so you need a, a, a wider class of, of objects. That's, that's our basic set. So remember that isometry means that you preserve lengths and angles, yeah? Uh, and, and of course, a, a totally reasonable thing to say is, well, if I can't preserve both, then maybe I'll just preserve one, right? And in particular, the mathematics uh, involved in angle preservation are really elegant, right? And this is this, this, this area of math called uh, conformal geometry. Incidentally, it's only elegant for two-dimensional objects. Uh, if you want a conformal uh, map of a volume, for instance, that's a much, much harder thing to, to deal with. Uh, but simply because sort of, it turns out that conformal geometry and area preservation and all this stuff links really cleanly into theory of all the complex numbers, that two-dimensional conformal geometry specifically is, is quite, quite elegant. Right? This is this idea of a Riemann uh, map. Uh, the, the, for our purposes, we're just going to summarize at a very high level kind of what's going on here and give you a point to it. Uh, because at the end of the day, these algorithms for, for conformal mapping, we're using all the stuff that we've already done in this class. We're using essentially Laplacian operators, some you know, amount of kind of marked information, and, and then some combinatorial search. And that's basically it. Yeah. Right, so like we talked about at the very end of last lecture, right? essentially our trick here is going to be, if I have a map from A to B that conserves angles, and a map from B to C that conserves angles, and I compose those things, and the composition also conserves angles. Yeah? That, I think, is a reasonable fact about life. Uh, but what that means is that, essentially, if I, if I have two different surfaces that I can map into each other, uh, and essentially I can map both of them into some domain where the conformal maps are somehow easier to work with, then I might as well do that. Uh, you know, map them both into this place where I can just parameterize all the set of, of, of angle-preserving maps. And then just work in that space because it's much easier and I haven't lost anything. That's a high-level strategy. And in particular, our, uh, our version of, of, of angle-preserving mapping that's going to be much easier to think about uh, is in the plane, or this extended plane, where you include points at infinity. Right? Um, so this is like the two-dimensional plane plus kind of vectors in every direction out from the origin. Right? That's what we glue onto this thing. So this is kind of like making the plane into a sphere. Like if I go far enough to the right, eventually I end up all the way to the left, although of course, the infinitely long, right? This is this uh, amount of camera projections we talked about a lot in computer vision. So, right, so the basic algorithm for, for what we call Mobius voting is that what we're going to do is take our two input services, so like here in this case I want to map from cat1 to cat2 here, and I'm going to map them in just an arbitrary way into the complex plane, uh, but in a way that's conformal, right? So I can't say anything about that map other than it preserves angles, right? And now, what I'm going to say is, if I want a conformal map from cat1 to cat2, that's equivalent to finding a conformal self-map from the plane onto itself. Because we, if we can compose conformal objects, uh, then uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's what we do. Does that the basic philosophy make sense here? And what we'll find is the, the set of conformal bijective self-maps of the plane, they're a very simple uh, set, of, set of operators, one that we can actually write down in close form. And, and, and so that's a really nice advantage here. We, we can formally map these two surfaces down here, and then to search among all of the different conformal maps between these two surfaces, all we have to do is, is, is test conformal maps downstairs, and, and those tend to be very easy to work with. Yeah? So, so that's the idea. In fact, what we'll find is that three points uh, specify a conformal map of the plane, which is a good thing. So, does anybody know uh, what those three points are? What conformal bijective maps of the plane are called? called Mobius transformations. Probably makes sense. This is a Mobius voting model. Yeah? Um, essentially, the Mobius transformations, uh, in theory, there should be a cute video of them right now. Yeah. Um, ah. Let him talk. Basic types. And show pen, right? The simple no, she wants to.
and inversions which turn the plane inside out. Notice this is what includes the points at infinity, right? That I took this rectangle and I mapped it to something like all the way up and then all the way back down, right? So that's it. In general, the Mobius transformation can be a complicated combination of all four effects. So, so the, the thing that they're not going to tell you in this cute uh, high school math video is that, of course, at the end of the day, the, 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 the Mobius transformations are really simple to parallelize. And you can essentially derive it from this, this spherical picture that they've drawn here, that all of them can be written, they're parameters by four numbers, A, B, C, and D, and they're self maps of the complex numbers. So these are four complex numbers. Right? Um, how many complex degrees of freedom are there? Right? It looks like there's four. Right? But, but remember, this is a rational number, right? So if I scale it up and down, then I haven't changed anything. So really, there are only three, three degrees of freedom here, right? And so at the end of the day, to specify a Mobius transformation of the plane, I just have to say where three points go, and then everything else follows. Yeah. So the uh, right. So so essentially, this this Mobius voting algorithm says, okay, I'm going to put a lot of hard work into conformally mapping a surface into the plane somehow, and then I'm just going to search over all of the possible. A uh, Mobius transformation, that's quite easy because all I need to do at the end of the day is compute these, these four numbers A, B, C, D, or equivalently just three points that correspond. Right? And so essentially, beyond these conformal maps into the plane, this algorithm is quite dumb. It just like, it randomly draws triplets of three points on two surfaces. Right? This defines a conformal map by this composition here. And then it kind of just measures how distorting that, that thing is from one surface onto the other. Right, you know the angle distortion is zero, so you can measure like, the area distortion. And if it looks good, you kind of keep it around. Yeah? And you just use this to vote for correspondence. So what you have is this big matrix, which is all the points on one surface, all the points on another surface, and then you say, okay, I'm going to randomly draw a Mobius transformation, and if it's a good one, like if, if things somehow preserve areas, then I'm going to increment all the numbers in this, this correspondence matrix corresponding to the, the pairs of points that that, that, that thing does. Right? And if, I, if I iterate this process, enough times, then what you find is that, in general, lots of conformal maps will kind of agree on the good stuff. I mean, there's, uh, there's Anna Karenina, I think, right? All happy families are happy the same way, and all unhappy families are unhappy in different ways. I obviously have to push it this quick. But uh, the, the basic idea here is that sort of the good maps constructively interfere, and the bad maps destructively interfere, and what you end up with is a nice thing. So the only thing that we're missing, um, is conformally mapping from the surface into the plane, right? Beyond that, we're good. Uh, and it turns out, well, what do you think shows up in conformally mapping the surface into the plane? I'll give you a hint, it's a linear self. Yeah, so, so once again, it turns out it's just a Laplacian operator. And, and one thing that you can show um, is that essentially by, by taking the Laplacian operator and extending it to complex coordinates, so that way you have x and y, um, all you have to do, once again, is solve Laplace u equals zero. Uh, to flatten the surface down into the plane. So uh, this paper has a, a very particular way of doing it that sort of counts degrees of freedom to make sure that the complex stuff works out, but these are just details. So at the end of the day, 
once again, to get your, 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 your harmonic map into the plane, or your, your ego-preserving map, it turns out it's, it's just hiding in the flash map for your game. So, at the end of the day, uh, the voting algorithm is, is very simple. Um, you take your two surfaces, you, you put them down downstairs, and then you just start randomly drawing Z1, Z2, Z3 in the first surface, W1, W2, and W3 in the second one, compute that A, B, C, and D for the Mobius transformation, uh, and then just start you know, adding votes if, if you have good correspondences that come out of this, this random map. Cool, very simple algorithm. So the, uh, the pros here are that it's a very efficient technique, and somehow this voting procedure can deal with some non-isometry, right? Like it's, it's searching among the conformal maps, the conformal map that best preserves areas. Does that make sense? Because everywhere that it searches, it never can leave the space of things that preserve angles, right? It, it's, that's just what it does by, by, by construction, right? Um, another way of viewing that is like sort of, you know, if this is, oh man, so if this is the set of isometric math, right? Then sort of this is contained within the set of conformal maths, right? Those are the ones that preserve uh, angles, and it's also contained uh, within the set of uh, uh, you know area preserving maths, uh, and, and that's right in this intersection, right? So it's searching this big space here. Right, the one that minimizes area distortion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the way the uh, the, the, the big the of the, uh, the downside of this voting procedure uh, is that it's a voting procedure, and, and and essentially all you do is you just kind of count up pairs of points that tend to agree with one another. But there's no notion of having a smooth map here, right? It's just, it's just sort of saying, oh look, these these two points tend to get mapped to, to each other in lots of conformal maps, so we'll kind of pair them with each other, right? So uh, one thing you might do is, is try to optimize for smoothness a little bit more directly. Right? Uh, and, and, and so there's one question which is, we sort of are really good at computing conformal maps, but what tends to happen is that a conformal map will be like very low distortion in one part of your surface, like maybe where you chose those three points, and then away from those you start to get some weird stuff. So then what would be a reasonable thing to do? Well, what do you know is that these conformal maps, these Mobius transformations we wrote down, what? Well, they're bijective, they're smooth, life is good, right? So somehow you'll only get in trouble from this voting procedure. Any one of those maps satisfies a lot of your criteria, it's just not no distortion. Yeah? So uh, kind of a more reasonable process may say, okay, this thing could get votes from like millions of, of different movies transformations, and that's not, that's not super smart. Maybe instead, I just find three really good ones that like map the head, shoulders, knees, and toes, I guess four. Uh, and then I just have to kind of glue them together at the interface. Right. Um, and, and, and that's exactly this technique called blended intrinsic maps. And I think, at least in the kind of computer graphics version of uh, uh, service correspondence, this is, is largely stated there. It's certainly what everybody compares against. And so in the blended intrinsic maps algorithm, the idea here is that rather than just having a voting procedure, I'm going to keep around those conformal maps, and I'm going to kind of weight them. In other words, I'm going to have this spatially varying weight along the surface, which says I'm going to have 20% of map 1 and 30% of map 2 and whatever, and that those weights change depending on where I am. Does that make sense? And so, then essentially, the, the, the only thing that the blended intrinsic maps has to do is figure out what those weights are. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and the way they do that is it's still not globally optimal. This thing still doesn't minimize any notion of distortion, but empirically it seems to do quite well. You can see that there's a lot of room for improvement here. This is a, this is a wide open area of research, and, and coming up with like just a totally stable, unsupervised mapping method that minimizes some notion of distortion, I don't think anybody has in either this literature or in like medical history. So, uh, right. so the idea here is that you're going to uh, come up with different blending weights and then essentially combine the good maps of different math, uh, uh, the, get the good parts of different maps. I did not have enough coffee this time. And, uh, you know, kind of zero out when we think that a math is high distortion. And so the, the visualization you should have is, is here. You have red, green, and blue, and essentially these correspond to three different mappings, right? Three different potential destinations for every point, and then what you're going to do is, is, is wait between them. By the way, does taking a weighted average of maps make any sense at all? No, like it's, not, it's totally unclear what I mean, right? So <laughs> uh, it, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of engineering that happens here, but, but in practice, this thing seems to work okay. So the algorithm here, the step one is that I'm going to just sample a bunch of Mobius transformations and sample a bunch of different conformal maps from surface A to surface B. And 
the first thing I want to do is at least come up with a set of maths that's consistent. Yeah. I remember this theme has come up a few times in the last couple of weeks, right? The, you know, if I, if I map, map to Jared, you know, then I can either do so by preserving left hand to left hand, or left hand to right hand, or like if I map, you know, a starfish onto another starfish, then that's five points that you deal with, or whatever. And somehow what I don't want is to average one left-right map and one right-left map, because then I'll get garbage. So after I sample all of my Mobius uh, transformations, I'd like to take some subset that makes sense for, for my problem, and then do averaging for, for distortion. Does that make sense? Because I could average two very low distortion maps that, like, are completely inconsistent, like going to totally different parts of the surface, and then it'd be in a lot of trouble. You know? Okay. So how do they do? Uh, how do they do this? Well, the first they they sample a bunch of maps, and their their first task is to take some subset of these that's consistent. This is a great paper for kind of synthesizing the stuff we've done in the last couple of weeks, right? Because one way to understand how to select a consistent subset of maps is to do clustering. Okay. So essentially, you have this whole collection of maps, and between any pair of them, you can measure how consistent they are. You see that? So for instance, like, given two maps, I could just iterate over every source point, and now they have two targets, one for each of the two maps, and if those two target points tend to be close by, then i say that somehow the similarity between these two things is, is, is large. Yeah? So in other words, two maps that disagree on the targets of lots of points, you think of as inconsistent with one another. So I make this big matrix of all these similar, or similar, all these similarity values, and then, what do you do? Well, you run spectral clustering, right? Our favorite algorithm here that can identify little blocks of, of consistent maps with each other. In other words, maps that kind of more or less agree. Yeah. So, okay, great. So now, step one of this algorithm, I, I identify some consistent maps, and I just throw out all the rest of them, because I, I don't want to average two things that, that don't agree. Yeah. Um, so then step two is to say, okay, well, I have a bunch of different maps. So now still every source on that has a bunch of different targets on Jerry. But um, I have to figure out how to wait between all those different targets. Right, so that's our next uh, our next job. And what we're going to say is that that weighting function depends on where you are on the surface. Essentially what I'm trying to figure out is like among maybe the five maps that I chose, which one is the best specifically for points on, on my arm. You see? So, uh, wait, so how you can you do that? Well, we know that all of these maps, just by construction, by fiat, are conformal. Right? They all present angles. Yeah? So if I, if I measure the angle conservation of, of, of any uh, Mobius transformation that, that goes from, from Adam to Jerry, it's not going to tell me anything, so it's going to say zero. Yeah. So the obvious thing to do here is to say, okay, well for every triangle on that, I can figure out how much its area changed. Okay? And what I like is that that number is close to one. In other words, that neither stretches nor compresses. Yeah? And so for every point and for every map on, on, on the source, I have some number telling me how good it is locally. Yeah? And essentially, all you do if you use that number to uh, come up with your weighting, and the, the convenient thing is that since you constructed these Mobius transformations to be super smooth, that weighting function just ends up being smooth for free. Right? You don't have to do anything special. Uh, and, and, and so essentially, for every you know triangle, you measure how much it you know stretches out the triangle, and you come up with weights that are inversely proportional to that, and you use that to find your target. Yeah. So in other words, when I want to make my math that kind of blends these different five intrinsic maths, what I do is I say, okay. Every point has like five different targets here, and those five targets have some kind of weight. Well, let's think back a couple lectures. What do we do? We have a, we have a metric space like this. We have a bunch of points. And we want to take an, a weighted average, and we have machinery for that. Right? We call this the computing of Barry Center. Yeah, and uh, we we talked about it. They take weighted averages and metric spaces. And that's precisely what they do. So here they they, they compute a center, and and that's what they use for their their final target for the for the. For the that's the, the basic algorithm. It's quite simple. Uh, and notice this isn't optimal in any sense. Like, this is one of these papers where they kind of say, like, first we do this, then we do that, then we do that. And, like, there's no, uh, uh, like, some variational problem they're trying to solve or something. Um, but it, 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 does, it does work quite nicely. And they ran, to their credit, they ran a huge benchmark and just showed, like, okay, we're going to ask probably some poor grad student to, like, mark 50 points on every, on this whole data set of services that, that correspond, and now we can just check against ground truth how well our algorithm does, right? And uh, the examples are pretty impressive for a pretty wide variety of, of things. So here what they do is they color one surface arbitrarily, they get paint on it, then they use the map to just transfer the painting onto the other surface. And you can see that these are pretty reasonably smooth uh, correspondences, yeah? And in fact, like, for, for symmetric surfaces, like these sunglasses here, 
Um, one thing you could do would be to say, look at that clustered set of maps and just extract two clusters instead of one. And now, if you're like not sure, like your, your, your geometry simply doesn't tell you whether you should have a left-right map or a right-left one, well, you can extract them both just by looking at different clusters. Yeah? Um, so this is a really nice technique. Um, and in practice, it works quite well. So people have applied it in all kinds of different circumstances. Everything from texture tra transferring graphics to uh, comparing teeth in the archaeology. Um, and this is somehow a generic method for just minimizing distortion of one map onto another. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that in almost all correspondence papers these days, so there's a plot that looks something like this. Um, so essentially, the idea here, uh, this curve, um, the, the x-axis here is geodesic error as a percentage of like the geodesic you know, diameter of your surface. The geodesic diameter will be like the farthest distance between any pair of points on the surface. Right? And then you could say, okay, let's say that I have a potential correspondence and I want to know how well I did. Right? So I have some ground truth correspondence, and I measure the distance between what I computed and the ground truth. And I look at that as a fraction of like the just diameter of your surface. Right? And so what this plot shows you is, is it's, it's like a percentile chart. Right? So like, think about this 0.05 here. Right? This is saying within 5% of the diameter of the surface, this thing is the percent of correspondences that your algorithm extracted that were within that 5% error mark. This is important, by the way, because the ground truth is a little suspect here. Remember we talked about that there really is a ground truth in this problem. Yeah. Um, the first, so up is good, up and to the left is what you want. And the blue one, of course, is blended intrinsic map, so that's good. But what do you notice about this plot? Is this like just generally a very good plot? <laughs> Like, let, let's read off some numbers here. So, so let's say that I want to be within 5% error, and I want to know how many percentages of, of, of my points are within 5% uh, error of ground truth. And, and for this algorithm, somewhere between 50 and 60%, right, is, is close to state of the art. Yeah? So that means about 40% of the points on your surface don't even get mapped within like 5% of the error. If, if you go to 10%, you know, the situation improves a little bit, there's still, you know, 20 percentile left of, of, of data to do. Yeah? So, what this plot should tell you is that this is an open problem, <laughs> right? The, the people are doing better than they used to, right? Uh, so for example, like HKM here is this one point isometric mapping thing that we talked about before. Um, you can see that like, that's the black line. Um, and, and at least for this, this pair of services, which is this guy doing, uh, I won't try to replicate it, uh, but uh, <laughs> making this close relative to, I think, just a person standing straight up. It actually doesn't work so great. Yes? Why was 5% the design pressure? It's not, it's just 5% uh, of reasonably small number for error. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, if you think about it, so 5% is like, what, 1 20th of the largest distance along your surface? Mm -hmm. I'd say it's a pretty reasonable kind of radius for error. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right. There's, there's no, you know, it depends on your application. Right? So, uh, for instance, I was just talking to a colleague this morning, and they're, they're measuring stuff for medical imaging, where they want to know, like, does your arm get puffier or something over time? And for them, 5% error would be, Useless, right? Because at that point, like, if you just moved your arm a little bit, you, you, you have the same error. Yeah. So, blended intrinsic math is really nice. I mean, it deals with non isometry really cleanly, which is it's, it's, it's very uncommon among these different techniques. It's unsupervised, it's efficient, you don't really have to mark points. But for certain pairs of shapes, you end up with lots of area distortion. Notice you tend to not have angle distortion because you're combining conformal maps. But you can because you're combining them. Um, and the other kind of more subtle issue is that we're really relying upon this um, uniformization, this, 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 this conformal mapping procedure, which only works for genus zero, only works for spheres. Um, so if you want to map a, uh, you know, a donut onto the plane conformally, you can't. Right? Uh, at least using the machinery we set up for you. Right? And, uh, which makes sense, right? That this slick uh, 80s video with the, the sphere rolling around, like no longer a flux. And suddenly you know there's another one about turning the sphere inside out, which is also a very cute 80s math video. I really like it. Uh, right. Uh, okay, so that's, I would say, in terms of just like the basic correspondence problem of like giving two surfaces, mark a point on surface A and tell me where it goes in surface B, this is probably close to state of the art. I won't say it's state of the art anymore because this is an active area of research. People study this quite a bit. But there's actually an interesting subtlety that I think is worth mentioning before we, 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 we depart from, from service correspondence. And that's actually the question of, what exactly do you want 
when you, when you solve this kind of a problem. And when I say that, I don't just mean in terms of your application, but I literally mean what do you want your code to output? Yeah? Uh, and in fact, when I, when I ask for a map and I draw you this nice picture where I have, you know, uh, here's surface one and here's surface two, and I say extract phi, like this makes sense in a differential geometry language. But if these two things are triangulated surfaces, and I ask, what is phi, like, on a computer, how should I store it? It's not totally clear. <laughs> um, do you see that? In particular, like, you know, we talk a lot about bijective maps, like maps that are invertible. But if these are two triangulated surfaces, what does it even mean for a map to be bijective? Right? If all I know, for example, is where every vertex goes, it's, it's super unclear, right? And, and to make matters worse, like, let's say this one has 10 vertices, and this has a thousand. Well, then I can't think about permutations. And if I just talk about like where the vertices go here, and I want to know where the midpoint of a triangle went, do you see how this is going to become very tricky? So, so for instance, uh, let me draw you examples of waving around this bar. Right? Proving kind of dangerous. Uh, let's say that I have a triangle, and on my other triangulated surface, I have another triangle, but it's subdivided. Yeah. And maybe I represent a correspondence in the most basic way, where I say, oh, great, the mapping algorithm tells me that A should go to A, uh, B should go to B, and C goes to go to C, right? This can be totally reasonable output. And my question for you is, well, where does this point go? Well, when we're talking about things like parameterization, it's, it's kind of reasonable, right? Remember we talked about piecewise linear maps? But like, let's say this is in 3D, and this vertex is like sitting out of the, the plane somewhere. Do you see how it's like not super clear how or like where I should map this thing? Because really, this is like the image of some subdivided guy, and I don't know where this subdivision goes inside of this coarse triangle. And like life could be much worse than this, right? I could take this guy and subdivide in some crazy way. I could have all kinds of geometry here. And somehow the map just between this set of vertices isn't enough to fill in the information in between. Right? So this is a really challenging question. This is the idea of representation when you're talking about maps. So it's not representation theory, by the way. It's literally representation. Like, like how do you represent that? Yeah? And, and there are a lot of different options, right? So, so essentially, all the algorithms we talked about so far, you can think of just like uh, permutation, or essentially, you know, for every point, like every vertex on the first guy, just tell me which vertex it corresponds to on the target. Yeah? Um, but that can get you into trouble for a lot of reasons, right? One of them is the sampling problem I showed you here. Another one, which is a little more subtle, uh, is remember that when you have triangulated surfaces, you know, there's no assumption on like every triangle having the same area or anything. It could be all kinds of different sizes. Let's okay? think in one dimension. Let's say I wanted to solve a one dimensional mapping problem. Okay? So I want to map a line segment onto a line segment. And just by accident, my discretization was like this. So on the left hand side, I choose two points in their midpoint. And on the right hand side, I choose two points. And I just discretize four labels on the left hand side. Yeah? Is, you can see how on triangular surfaces, how this could appear. Like maybe some triangles are big and some triangles are small. Well, now I have three points on both sides, so maybe you think, okay, great, a permutation is uh, a totally reasonable way to map one object onto another one, right? I have three things, three things, life is good. But what is the best possible map I can compute here, right? Well, maybe I take the left hand side, the left hand side, the right hand side, the right hand side, and the common toilet all I'm left with is that. But notice that that's not really the map you wanted, right? That somehow, this map's actually quite nonlinear, even though there's a totally reasonable low distortion correspondence that was there, you just can't see it in the vertex positions. You need to put something in between. Yeah. So uh, these are the kinds of subtleties that pop up when you start talking about correspondence problems. And they're really, really fundamental. Right? Like it's it's when you when you talk about correspondence, okay, for one thing, on the differential geometry side, it's a very hard problem. Right? I mean we talked about Mobius transformations and area distortion and angle distortion. But then on the discrete side, it's also not clear yeah? And, and, and so you have to worry about representation. Like, do you have a permutation? Maybe you say, okay, you know, for every point here, I just want some point here, and, and so I'm, I'm going to allow myself to subdivide line segments, right? That sounds pretty good. But then what if I want the inverse of this map? <laughs> well, it's not super clear how to do that anymore, right? Um, in particular, now I ask, where did that point go? Well, on the line, maybe it's easy enough, but on triangulated surface, it's not so easy. Yeah? Uh, or uh, maybe I have some kind of probabilistic interpretation where I say, okay, for this point, I'm just going to maintain a distribution over points here uh, that tells me where I expect that point to be. So, and so for each of these, people have studied them quite a bit. And, and, and the takeaway seems to be that, 
once again, unfortunately, there's no, there's no free lunch here. Right? The, you have to decide what you want in your mapping software and then choose your algorithm accordingly. Yeah. Sadly, that's just the answer a lot of times in geometry classes. So I thought, as a good example of something totally different from what we've talked about so far, I'd highlight one, one piece of literature maybe in the last six or seven years that has, has been a pretty popular idea, um, which is cool, actually. We, we wrote this paper in, I think, 2012. Um, I want to say we here, by the way, this isn't area, like this really happens to be an area that, that, that at, at Port Um But uh, we wrote this paper in 2012, and it was like a fun side note, and then it turned out to be like one of these things that just got picked up by a million people working on different extensions, which is cool. So the basic idea here, this is an object called a functional map. And uh, the basic idea I've tried to, to illustrate in this, this goofy slide. So here, let's say that I have two services, M0 and M here. And this is like this guy standing up, and this other guy doing the the two things, yeah? And my job is to extract a correspondence from one to the other, or in other words, to extract a map phi from M0 to M. Yeah? So, uh, the way, what is our abstraction of phi here? Well, it's an object that takes points to points. But notice that this, this creates some kind of asymmetry here, right? Like, even if I want it to be phi to be low distortion and, bi and bijective, somehow just by construction, the fact that this arrow points to the right is, is, is going to bias my algorithm. Right? If, I, if I took my, any of the mapping techniques that we've talked about so far, and I just reverse which one is M0 and which one is M, I would not get the same map back, which is a problem. Yeah? So the idea in functional maps, uh, I, I kind of think it's kind of slick. So, so the, the idea here is, let's say that I have a map from M0 to M, and now I paint M. Right? So in this case I have... <laughs> This is about the, the, the quality part that you, you get from, from mathematicians, but since I take the guy on the right hand side, I paint him kind of purplish and greenish in different places. Right? So now, my question is, can I paint M0 using the same colors? And the answer is yes, right? So for every point on M0, I follow the map phi forward, I read off the color, and then I put it on M. No. Does that make sense? So for every map from left to right, I have a way that takes paint from right to left. <laughs> you see that? So this is the idea of a functional map. So for every forward map here, I have a backward map that takes, okay, so what, how do we formalize paint? We'd say it's like a function on the surface, right? So one assignment of a number per point here. And essentially I have a linear operator that takes me from functions on the right-hand side to functions on the left-hand side. Right? And the way that it does that is I follow the map forward and I just read off the number and, and I pull it back. And different geometry we call this a pullback. Does the basic construction here make sense? So for every phi, there's an operator f sub phi, which goes from functions on the right to functions on the left. Now, what, what properties do we have for f sub phi? Well, for one thing, let's say I take two functions on the right hand side and add them together, and then I pull them back. Do you agree with me that that's the same as pulling them back and then adding them together? Just the way that I've defined this, right? I just look forward. And similarly, if I scale one and I pull it back, same thing as pulling back and scaling it. So in other words, this map is a map of function spaces, is what? It's linear. Yeah. Okay. This is a good thing, right? I mean, somehow, mapping is a very nonlinear problem, right? When you're given two surfaces and you're trying to minimize you know, distortion, right? We have these really crazy measures in terms of eigenvalues, like what it means to distort one object onto another. But somehow there's this little glimmer of hope that there's something linear hiding inside of this, this mapping problem. If only we can, we can make use of it. Incidentally, for, for mathematicians in the class, this should remind you of something, which is, which is uh, the, the, the category theory. Right? So remember, category theory is all about kind of how to take spaces and map them. For every covariant object, there's a contravariant object going the other way. This is exactly what's going on here. Then we have for every map going this way, we have a contravariant map of function spaces. Exactly. And incidentally, this is just like all these primal dual constructions we've done in this class. Can't escape it, guys. Okay, so, uh, right. so in practice, what do we do in functional models? Well, this is, once again, notice that the last couple lectures in this class are going to synthesize a lot of stuff that we've done, yeah? In fact, this is going to combine two things. So, first of all, let's say that I take uh, functions on the two surfaces and I write them in two different bases. Right? Basis for functional surface one and the basis for functional surface two. Um, and what basis could I use? Well, in the absence of any other information, maybe I use the possible charm eigen functions, yeah? So in other words, I have uh, any function on my source surface, I can write as maybe uh, f naught of x equals 
a uh, not uh, psi. Right? Or I'm thinking of this as a basis for functions on the surface. Remember, so a good basis for functions is the Fourier basis, which looks like the ones that satisfy the Laplacian. The psi i not equals delta i not psi like that. So I'm going to expand every function in the Fourier basis. These are just cosine and sense, or whatever they are on Homer Simpson here. Yeah? And I can do the same thing with a function on the target. Right? I can write f of x, then he's equal to some a i psi i. Notice these are not the same. That this is a function on, on the set surface, this is a function on the target. But so far, my, my calculations are independent. Yeah? When I write stuff in a basis, and I have a linear map in between them, Right, so you can think of these AIs like vectors. And what is all your map? How do I represent it? Between the basis vectors. Yeah. Or matrix. Yeah. I have a linear map between vectors. It's a matrix. Yeah. So in other words, you know, I, I talked about functional uh, different ways of representing a map from one surface onto another. This is a very different representation. What it says is it's how to take Fourier basis on one surface and give back Fourier basis on the other. Yeah? And that's going to be the, the, the representation. Right? And, and the reason, this is kind of a nice compact thing to do, right? Because at the end of the day, well, so really these sums should be you know, i equals 0 to infinity. Um, obviously, this isn't very realistic, so what do I do in practice? I restrict this to some smaller basis and I work with that. Yeah, so our representation of the map is very nice. It's just some matrix that takes eigenfunctions to eigenfunctions. And this is pretty nice, right? Because eigenfunctions have to do, you know, they're nice smooth objects on the surface, and they have some reasonable little interpolation behavior. So even if you truncate this thing, sometimes you can get a nice map anyway. So there's so many questions that are hiding here. Uh, namely, like, okay, this is a great representation of a map, but I haven't actually told you how to get it. Right? And, and, and of course, you know, if the way that you get it is essentially by running one of these other algorithms and just converting, then you haven't really gained anything, right? Um, so, why is this useful? Well, the question is, so again, at the end of the day, uh, the, the way I can think about it is my unknown object is a matrix M that takes the coefficients A1, uh, A2, A3, and goes back A1, Right, for every set of bits. Do you see that? That's what a functional map is? Maybe we have an idea. So how can I approximate? So our unknown object is the object M. Notice M can contain negative numbers. It's not a permutation anymore. We're, we're in some funny cases. Yeah? How can I compute M? Does anybody have any ideas? This is a, a, kind of a tricky thing. So how can I put a constraint on M? Let's say that you know, I take a bucket of paint and I paint one surface, and I paint another surface, and rather than you know, mapping paint from one to another, I just tell you that I painted these two things consistently. Right? What does that say? Well, it says I, I come up with one vector over here, uh, V, and another vector over here, W. These correspond to the two you know, ways that I painted these two surfaces. Right? And I'm telling you that they're the same. So in other words, I now have a constraint on M, that M has to take this paint to that paint. So if I can come up with n of these, then I'm done, right? You see that, the, that if I have enough constraints that look like this, I can recover the matrix n. So then our object, uh, our, our, the name of the game here, becomes to invent as many textures on two surfaces that we know agree without computing a map. And the question is like, well, why is that reasonable? So let's say that I have two surfaces that are isometric. Yeah? And remember, what do we know about Gaussian curvature? You guys remember this? There's a, there's, a, there's a special theorem by Gauss on, on Gaussian curvature. It has a Latin name. It roughly corresponds to like totally awesome theorem in Latin. And what it tells you is that Gaussian curvature is intrinsic. Okay? In other words, it only depends on geodesic distances. Yeah? So let's say that I have two surfaces that are isometric. They're, they're exactly the same uh, geodesic distance wise. They're only different extrinsic. So a great example of pairs of surfaces like this are like a human Ouch. A human with uh, <laughs> their arms up and down, right? Because everything here is moving rigidly except for very small space. Yeah? So these are approximately isometric space. Okay. So let's say that I have a, you know, here's 
here's Jared, uh, and here's Tom, and 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 uh, that we think of the, you know that there's some map here, but I don't uh, that that preserves distances from one or the other. The only issue is that I don't know this map. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Using lecture four from this class, I can compute Gaussian curvature, right? And essentially, what this does is it takes my can of, of, of body paint here, and at every point on, you know, Jared, and at every point on Tom, it assigns a Gaussian curvature number, right? Like maybe it's four here and seven there. I don't know. Yeah? What do I know? Well, I know, so, so here I have Gaussian curvature uh, zero, and here I have Gaussian curvature. And if I believe that M is an isometry, then what do I know? I know that M times, remember that M goes this way? So M times curvature equals curvature. Yeah? Do you see what just happened here? I calculated, how did I calculate these kids? Did they involve a map? No, right? I used an assumption about the map to find a pair of functions that corresponds, and now I have a linear condition on M, even though I never put the two in correspondence. Do you see that? It's a really slick idea. Okay, so unfortunately, so if you think about it, this is N constraints, right? Because there's N elements in these two vectors. How many things are in M here? Like N squared, so this isn't enough. I need a lot of descriptors that do this. Um, anybody have any ideas? What can I do? So I just want to start painting on two functions, uh, two surfaces, functions that, that correspond, even though I, I don't know the correspondence. What's, what's the name of the game? So, so, well, what else is intrinsic? What's our favorite intrinsic thing in this class? The Laplace algebra, right? And any calculation I do the Laplace algebra that jumps out a function, if I assume that these two surfaces are, are isometric to each other, will give me pairs of functions that I know correspond even if I don't know the correspondence. Right? So for instance, how can I get an infinite number of these functions? Well, I can compute the heat kernel map. Right? So for every t, I get a different function, the heat kernel map. This is this ridiculously long list of, of, of functions that correspond from one surface to another. Well, so a way of encoding that is essentially I have something, you know, I have functions and uh, you know, functions on the other guy, and I expect that m carries them all over. I don't get m. If this thing, let's say I have exactly n of these. Well, now this thing's invertible. I can just say, okay. Done. Now I've done. It's a hell of a lot easier than Mobius transformation and voting and waiting and this and that. So what's the draw? Why is this why is this too good for you? Any ideas? What's uh, what goes wrong? Why why the I mean, way I've sold it to you, like why the hell would we why would I even talk about the on the other side? Like this is you know, backslash and out. I can get that other stuff that's working somewhere to get the other ones. Well, what did I need to make this this the same work? Well, yeah, but I can get basis functions easily, right? All services have a functions, that's okay. But I also need a large number of f's that correspond. And how did I get that? Well, I assume that these services are isometric. Well, okay, but I just told you that, like, I, I can't, most services aren't isometric. So this particular pipeline I've laid out for you really doesn't work all that great. Um, it turns out if you have things that are exactly isometric, that you can really, really carefully construct, and then this algorithm works great, it's provable, right? It gives you that much more. Um, and otherwise, it falls apart pretty fast. But some of the philosophy makes sense, right? I mean, specifically what fell apart. Well, in fact, if somebody gave me pairs of functions that corresponded, even if these aren't in, in isometry to each other, I would still be in good shape, right? I mean, uh, this stuff is still true. The only thing that, that, that's hard is finding those functions. Yeah? So what it does is it takes your problem and it makes it into another problem which is competing descriptors. And the more reliable the descriptors you have, the better the functional map you get. You see that? So we have really good descriptors for isometric, isometric maps. Um, we have less and less good descriptors <laughs> as you put weaker assumptions like oh, couple of um, But there's another question here. Let's say that I have a random number generator. In fact, I do, I have many. Um, and uh, I randomly generate a matrix M. Right? My question is, does M have to be a correspondence? No, it could be any number of things. So for instance, what if M were all zero? 
right? And we take functions on, on the surface to nothing, yeah? So the space of M's that correspond to these objects uh, F sub phi here is a very small space from the whole set of M's here, yeah? And, and so um, one question you might ask is, okay, what if I have like okay-ish descriptors? In other words, okay, so I don't expect to have an equality because you know, this is a little fuzzy, a little fishy, but I at least expect, like, okay, in a least square sense, maybe these things are nearby. And then, well, what could we do? What, what is the typical thing we do when we have some least squares problem we want to so we'll make it better? Well, what we can do is study, like, what is the space of M's that we expect to have? And we can regularize our problem. We can add terms for optimization to try to push it toward that space. Okay? In other words, for example, we know that M equals zero is a bad idea. Or an M that doesn't take consequences of consequences. So we can write down all of our favorite assumptions, uh, or we can start to kind of study this space of maths a little bit. So you can do it. In fact, you can actually carry out these experiments. So for instance, let's say that I basically compute a map from this cat standing here to the cat on the right-hand side. And notice that the, the way you should read this is by color. I don't know, can you guys see this? Or just show your own Is this okay? So you see how the left map makes sense. <laughs> And the right map here is, is garbage. It takes the tail to the face somehow. In fact, I'm actually very impressed that Max managed to extract something this smooth. Um, so if you run this experiment, and specifically if you choose the Laplace Beltrami basis, right? So you write things in, in the Fourier functions, you look at the matrix that you get when you do this, this, this kind of a pipeline. Yeah? An interesting thing happens. What do you notice about the left? I mean you can always encode a map as a functional map, it just might not be a very map. Nice looking one, right? Um, what do you notice about the left one versus the right one? Can you guys see this? Let me turn on the lights. The left one looks diagonal. <laughs> yeah? The right one doesn't. Yeah? Uh, and in fact, more than that, um, the left one looks more diagonal the more left you go, <laughs> the more up and the left. You see that? So I told you that I, I computed these, these matrices in the Laplace Beltrami basis. Does anybody have a hypothesis? Why do these look diagonal? Let's say I have no repeated eigenvalues on my two surfaces. If I have no repeated eigenvalues and my map is actually isometric, what happens? Well, think about it for a second. Yeah. So let's say the you know the eigenvalues are one, two, three, four, and five, and each of those have an eigenfunction on the two surfaces. So we know it's the same eigenvalues in the two because they're asymmetric. Yeah. What do we know about the eigenfunction corresponding to eigenvalue 1 on the first surface? It should get mapped to the eigenfunction corresponding to eigenvalue 1 on the other surface. So only for 2, 3, 4, and 5, right? So if my surfaces are exactly isometric and there are no repeated eigenvalues, then what should this matrix be? Yeah. Identity. Yeah, it just says take corresponding, assuming I sort the eigenvalues, it just says, you know, take corresponding eigenvalues to each other. And the kind of interesting thing here is that as you deviate from isometry, this matrix tend to, it tends to deviate from identity. And, and, and so the question is, how could you regularize this in an interesting way? Okay. And well, for one thing, it might be the case that you don't want to choose this Laplace Peltrami basis. It's kind of a dangerous basis and it's very unlocal. Right? Um, and so the question is, okay, rather than just asking that M is diagonal, that only works if you if you're in this one specific basis, what could you do? Well, one trick here, which goes back uh, to everybody's favorite topic, Kyle said a liter of it. So, so far I told you, remember we talked about linearity? We said, like, if I add two functions together, and then I map with the other guy, then I should get the sum over there. So, now, actually, this is already have our picture over here. So let's say that I have f over here, and it gets mapped to f now. Yeah. And now, let's say that I differentiate f. I take the Laplacian of f and I map it over here. And then I might ask that what I get back is roughly the Laplacian over there. Right? This makes sense. And somehow differentiating on the right-hand side, differentiating on the left-hand side should agree. Notice in, in the presence of isometry, these things agree exactly. Yeah? So one thing I could do would be to say, okay, well, what does this mean? This means if I have a function, remember I have uh, ch -ch 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 -ch, like that, and my map is going to map me from there to there. Okay, so let's say that I differentiate. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Right, so 
so let's say that I map it. And what I'm saying is that, uh, ah, man, I keep doing this one. Okay. Uh, right. Now what I'm saying is I can either differentiate here, or I can differentiate here. Um, and then these two things should be kind of the same. So uh, at the end of the day, what you get is kind of a commutator, right? It says I can differentiate and then map, or I can map and then differentiate, right? So how could I write that down? I could say, M rad F should approximately be, uh, right? Notice these are two different matrices, these two little functions. Yeah. But they're just matrices, and they're, they're only functions of one surface. That's the name of the game of functional maps. We want to do as much as we can on a single surface before doing an M, right? So in other words, I could add, so I could say, okay, I, maybe I come up with a bunch of descriptors and I want to, you know, you know, my job is to find a map M, I'd like, you know, for my descriptors, I'd like them to be preserved, like that. There's a, there's a reason why I do that. Yeah. And I'm going to regularize this problem by saying it also preserves derivatives. And how could I do that? I could say, OK. Um, any ideas? How, how could I do that? Actually, I'll take a look at this relationship. Right? So I want this to hold for all f. Yeah. So in other words, I kind of want Feature? No. Well, if I want two things to approximately equal each other, what do I do? I subtract them, I square, and I add. Yeah. So, in other words, I have M. Yeah. This is a totally reasonable, that's a two. <laughs> that's a totally reasonable regular result for this one. See that? So, essentially, what this is saying is take descriptors to descriptors, but also give me a map that's approximately diagonal. So, this is the name of the game, and there's all kinds of different uh, functional maps papers out there that do all kinds of different things. Okay? Um, so, for instance, one thing you can prove is that any time that phi is an isometry, then m, okay, it may not be diagonal because you might have repeated eigenvalues, but it should be orthogonal. Right? So, oh, maybe what I do is add a constraint here that makes this thing orthogonal. Or like you, so you can imagine that this is a nice kind of gateway into the world of optimization. You can start writing down all the properties that you want M to have, and then just start kind of chaining together more and more terms of your optimization problem that they're trying to find. Yeah? And, and, and there's a whole kind of industry of people that do that. Right? So at the end of the day, you know, you have some, some functions that you want to be pre preserved, and so maybe you have this constraint. I'm sorry, I have C here instead of M, whatever. Right? And so I have a nice constraint there. But then maybe I want, for example, my map to commute with operators. As we might. Or, uh, uh, you know, maybe I want it to be orthogonal because, you know, someone was testing with isometry. Or, uh, maybe I choose a basis that isn't a possible Schwami basis, but rather is kind of local. Like it's just a little, you know, like a partition of unity, like something that's kind of lying on a vertex and drops off. And then I want my basis not necessarily to be diagonal, but to kind of look like a permutation. And you could try and come up with, with regulars that do that. Right? So there's all kinds of different tricks. And, and essentially, if you just look up this functional mass figure, you'll see all kinds of people that cite it. And this is a nice kind of opportunity to, to play with mapping uh, in an accessible way. Right? Because, for example, implementing blended intrinsic maps is a pain in the, the token. So implementing these squares is like no big deal. So this is, this is a nice kind of easy way to, to get your hands on that fast. And sometimes it works. Uh, right, so, so the pros here, continuing our little table here, is that, that you have a very condensed representation. Like if you just want an approximate map, you could, for example, just compute like the upper left little portion of M in some basis or another. Um, it's, you know, you have all this linear machinery, it's a very weird perspective on correspondence, it's a little different from the normal one. Um, and there are many recent papers that are exploring different variations of this. But of course the con is that when you have non-isometric surfaces, once again it becomes difficult. Although the difficulty drops off a little less crazily than using, for example, this one point mapping. That, that regularizers like this one seems to do okay in the presence of a prospect. Yeah, so I encourage you guys to dig around a little bit in terms of people that use this stuff because they're all kind of interesting ideas in this world. And then, and then this is a nice kind of mathematical idea. Another kind of interesting con here. So let's say at the end of the day, like I really do want a correspondence. I want a point and a point on one surface and tell me when. You guys have any ideas? How would I go about doing From a given function. Go to prick a feet on the point. What was that? Go to prick a feet on the point. 
Sure, or more generally, just put like a one on the vertex of Kerbal, a zero or whatever else, and that's a function, and now see where that function is, and that gives you your target. But remember that I talked about how it's very difficult to constrain M to be the set in a set of things that are actually maps. So in practice, what happens is you take a you know a, a nice delta function on one side, you map it forward, and what you get is some ringed weird thing on the right hand side, right? And so another kind of drawback of this procedure is, is maybe it takes regions to regions, but it's very difficult to sharpen to a point, right? And those of you that are engineers should kind of have that intuition already, right? Like what happens if you do calculations of the Fourier basis and you truncate high frequencies, right? You get these artifacts called ring, right? And that's exactly what's going to happen here, right? So you can get some kind of smoothed out notion of a map, but you won't get a map. There are a lot of drawbacks. That's the all kinds of cool extensions. So, for instance, um, you know, the Laplace basis, right? We extract it just to be optimal for one surface. We don't really extract it to be optimal for mapping procedures. So, you might imagine trying to come up with a basis on two surfaces that kind of corresponds. So, for instance, here the processes are that proposed. We do coupled quasi-harmonic bases. So, the idea is that I'm going to compute the basis and the map at the same time. And maybe I'm only willing to have a basis of 10 vectors, but I want them to correspond to each other. Right? So there's an interesting optimization problem that that's, that's happening. Um, or maybe instead of just throwing up your hands in the presence of symmetry, you try to identify and kind of compute maps modulo of that symmetry. Right? So this actually behaves quite nicely under, under the functional maps literature, because what is a symmetry? It's a self-map. Do you see that? So in other words, it's a, it's a map, a linear map of your function space on like m, m, m non m, onto itself. So this is another matrix, right? And so it's very easy to understand symmetries in the language of operators. Right? It's just another, like a matrix that rotates 90 degrees or something like that. And, and so you can try and build that into your mapping machinery to either disambiguate a uh, symmetry, it would be one way to go, like give some, you know, mark a couple points, or to come with a map that works on the, on the uh, quotient space. I don't know, like this eight-way symmetry of this octopus. Maybe I just can't deal with that. So what I'd rather do is just say every point here goes to eight points on the target. Um, and, and one way to do that is to say I'm going to look at the orbit of, of the target function under this 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 operator that, that, that pulls out symmetries. All kinds of interesting things. Nothing you can do. Um, one thing that's a little subtle about this functional maps literature. Let's say that at the end of the day, you know. At the end of the day, I, I give you a functional map and I ask you, how much does this distort angles? Could you answer that question? It's like ridiculously hard, right? Because you don't even take points to points. It's, it's like not clear what that even means, and, except in a, in a very limited case. Yeah? Um, it turns out that you actually can extract notions of distortion from a functional map, even if it's truncated, but it's really tricky how to do that. Um, Incidentally, can anybody think of an operator? So remember that functional maps are all about operators. They take functions. Uh, can anybody think of an operator that knows about angles and areas? The Laplacian team, right? Remember we talked in our lecture about Laplacian that actually, given a Laplacian matrix, you can extract all the edge lengths of the triangle mesh, right? So, and the Laplacian operator is a nice thing that can deal with low frequencies, right? So essentially, this paper is on an object called shape differences that looks at um, truncated functional maps and is able to use the Laplacian operator and prove that by kind of looking at things like commutativity and so on, what you really get is some measure of how well this thing preserves angles in the geometry system, which is a nice connection back to what we were interested in. Okay. Finally, uh, one other thing that, that like a very different approach here uh, is, is rather than taking functions to functions, maybe you take distributions to distributions. Right? So maybe I take a point to a distribution over the target surface that kind of lights up when I think that that point should correspond but I'm willing to at least kind of make it fuzzy in that way. Notice these are slightly different problems, like the difference between L1 and L2. Okay. Um, so in particular, a very bad basis for probability distributions would be a possible trauma, right? because probability distributions are positive. right? And these functions always have equal parts positive and negative. Remember this, this current thing. Right? So, so you can imagine a very different mapping pipeline that just deals with positive numbers and kind of you know, makes things fuzzy in the sense that I don't force a permutation, I don't force a point to go to a single point on the target, but it's still not quite a function. Notice you can get functions by expectations here. Um, so there's no connection between these things. Anyway, this is just a term you can Google. It's fuzzy maps or soft maps. It's yet another way to go. And there could easily be another three-level on the OK. 
So anyway, that kind of concludes our discussion of surface correspondence. Anybody have any questions before we'll motivate uh, consistent correspondence in the video for today? Cool. Yeah, so this is like one of these new frontiers in geometry processing that really, when it comes to collections of, of more than just one shape at a time, uh, the methods, as you guys can probably see, are pretty rudimentary right now. And, and, and really, there's a lot of room to explore and, and think of some creative ways to, uh, to make them better. Okay, so for our next, and what it feels like is probably the final topic in this class, given the amount of time we have left, uh, we're going to talk about consistent correspondence. You notice we follow the same pattern between the segmentation, right? We first talked about segmenting a single surface, and then we talked about consistent segmentation, like given five surfaces, how can I segment them to get the same segment on every single one? Well, we can do a similar thing with, with surface correspondence, right? So, in particular, uh, you know, the, the previous kind of set of slides here, we said, you know, given a horse and a donkey or a horse and a giraffe, I just want to find correspondence between one guy and the other. Yeah. So let's say that I downloaded software for blended intrinsic maps, or for you know, free server and the, the, the brain imaging world, or whatever your favorite correspondence method is. Yeah. And I did the following experiment. So I, I downloaded five different matches, and I mapped from the horse to the donkey, the donkey to the giraffe, the giraffe to the zebra, and the zebra back to the horse. So now I have one to be four maps, all computed using blended intrinsic maps. And notice these form a cycle, right? So I can actually find a map from the horse back onto itself, right? I can like choose the nose of the horse, map to the nose of the donkey, the nose of this guy, and so on and so forth. What do you think happens? <laughs> well, okay, all these mapping procedures are already super messy, right? And so what'll happen in general is you sort of start to accumulate error, right? You map the, the, the nose to the nose to the nose to the nose, and pretty soon you're like on the floor. <laughs> this is absolutely true. I encourage you guys, download the software and give it a try. Um, this is even true for, for pretty restrictive, like, you know, we only care about mapping between four-legged animals, ten algorithms, even the nose tend to be pretty inconsistent. So my first question for you guys is, is what would I expect in the post round cycle? I think I have a bunch of maps, I computed them all. You know, in the absence of other information, what would I probably expect my mapping tool to do? Well, now I have a self-map, but what would I expect that self-map to be? Okay. The identity, right? So if I'm in functional maps, by the way, how do you compose functional maps? It's just major implications. It's another nice kind of feature. But uh, if I compose a bunch of functional maps together, maybe I want the identity matrix. But in reality, I mean, nothing about the algorithms that I told you before have any guarantee of that sort, right? I mean, and in fact, it's actually not 100% clear that you should. Like, it's not clear that if I minimize the distortion of A onto B, and then I minimize the distortion of B onto C, and then I minimize the distortion of C onto A, it's not clear that composing them minimizes the distortion. Do you see what I'm saying? That uh, you're solving different problems each time, and, and they're slightly different. Yeah. So, what you might say is, okay, yeah, that's the case, but intuitively, it, you know, if I have a bunch of four-legged creatures, I don't expect this to be really the behavior. I really do expect you know, and not to matter what order I compose in the loop or whatever. Right? And this property has a name, it's called cycle consistency. Right? The idea is exactly what it sounds like, right? That if I compute maps in a cycle from one shape to another, and I compose them all, then I should get the identity matrix. Yeah. And this is kind of a reasonable assumption. And this has really only been composed the last couple of years in geometry processing literature. And, and, and I actually think this is like one of these really, really, really important themes in geometry. Because think about it this way. So, so let's say that I'm, I'm trying to come up with machine learning software that, that maps between you know, 3D scans of chips. Right? I might not be able to say much about the geometry of the space of chips. Like, I, I don't know if they should have angles preserved or areas or whatever. However, I do think it's a reasonable assumption to have that my mapping tool be consistent. <laughs> right? And so somehow this is a weaker assumption than anything geometric. Right? And so I actually think it's really valuable in a lot of cases. Right? Another good example would be like in, in medical image segmentation. Right? Like, I don't know the first thing about anatomy, and if I invent a brain mapping tool that minimizes area distortion, yeah, it'll give me something, but I have no idea if it, if it preserves anatomical features. But at the very least, under the assumption that everybody has more or less the same anatomy, something like cycle consistency makes sense, even if things like geometry don't. You know, that's our, our kind of our, our setup. So why haven't we considered that? Well, think about in functional maps. What happens? So if I want cycle consistency, like I compute three maps at a time, what does making straight look like? It looks like the product of three matrices equals the identity. And those of you who are experiencing optimization should know that that's a really unpleasant constraint to enforce. Right? The second you multiply two things, and that shows them not optimization problem, they're very 
few cases where that's a, a, a pleasant thing to work with. Yeah? Another way of putting it is, you know, it's even worse for things like blended intrinsic maps, right? What am I saying? I'm saying like f of g of h equals identity. Like, it's not even clear how to write that down. Yeah. Um, so these are, are really hard to think about. But there's sort of a contrasting. There's sort of two views that are sort of at odds at each other in, in the consistent correspondence world, right? But on the one hand, like somehow from an optimization perspective, like if you look at, for example, the functional last letter chart and have like three of these and ask that their product is the identity, like I have no idea how to enforce things. Right? That's a really hard thing to work with. On the flip side, there's always going to be said that the more data you have, you know, the, the more better you should do. Yeah? In particular, if you have like 100 horses, then you can start to figure out what they have in common, where you only have two and there's some ambiguity there. Yeah? So, on the one hand, this is an unpleasant sort of optimization constraint, but on the other hand, somehow, you know, if I only give you two puzzle pieces, maybe life is hard, but the more puzzle pieces I give you, it's a more global picture of the world I can, I can figure out. And our job is somehow to figure out mapping algorithms that look more like the second picture, less like the first one, because this is the optimistic view. Yeah. The other one is, 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 is hard to think about. Yeah. Or a different sort of philosophical way to put it is that if your mapping tool is inconsistent, you better have a very good reason for it to be. Right? That's sort of the absence of any other information about how you compute correspondence. Consistency is a good place to start. Does anybody uh, have any questions about our, uh, our setups? That makes sense. Right? I think this is a totally reasonable kind of assumption. But, right? The reason people have been studying it is just because it's hard. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's what's at the end of this class. There are some results for like niceness of optimization of products of matrices. Yeah. I imagine to the extent well, the products have 100 matrices. Probably not. Yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Right? The more things you add to your, your, your data set, the worse it gets. Or it doesn't. So one thing that we, we will prove if we have time is that cycles consistency among cycles of three things is, is sufficient for a for, for longer time. So two cycles are really boring. This is A to B and then B to A. Um, three cycles would be A to B to C to A. And it turns out, if, 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 under certain formality, if you have uh, a consistent, a three cycle consistent collection of maps, then it is n cycle consistent. Okay. okay. So our simplest formulation will be that I have, I have n shapes and I have n squared maps. And maybe my job is to take these n squared maps and approximate them with n squared new maps that are all cycle consistent. Yeah. Um, notice I've, I've cheated a little bit here. You guys see, it, like, even in my problem formulation, we're cheating a little. This is a really weird input, right? That I'm saying, what I'm going to do is kind of be like the janitor that comes in afterward and cleans up the set of maps that you gave me. But where do those maps come from? It's super unclear, right? So uh, really what you should do is take an entire collection of shapes and map them all to each other at the same time while enforcing consistency. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's sort of the, uh, the, the holy grail here, and, and this is an open problem. There's actually very few methods that even attempt to do this, and certainly not any that do it in a sort of provably optimal way in any sense. I say that, of course, like I could look up tomorrow and archive that big paper. Like, this is something you can How easy do you think this problem is? <laughs> like, does this smell like an easy problem, extracting consistent maps? No. Like, this is a really difficult problem. And, and just like segmentation, and just like clustering, and just like all these other things we've talked about, unfortunately, almost any formal, formal way of writing down the, the, the consistent map, even the consistent map approximation problem, is really hard, yeah. um, and, and like NP hard. Yeah. So, so for instance, in this, um, unfortunately, this guy doesn't get enough credit. He's, this is just in the PhD thesis. He actually he never published it. Um, good lesson, you guys. Uh, but he sort of was one of the first to consider this idea of consistency. Um, and the way that he views it is, you say on this graph where every node is a shape and every edge is a map. And, and it sounds I can think of consistent mapping like extracting a spanning tree. Do you see that? Because if, if, if I compose maps and I have this graph, then essentially what I'm saying is that it's sort of path independent. How I hop from one edge to another to get from one shape to another, because no matter how I compose, I get the same thing. So an equivalent problem to consistent mapping is extracting a, a spanning tree of maps. But your criterion for what spanning tree you want is kind of weird, right? You're, you're, you're not extracting like a minimum spanning tree, like something that just minimizes some of your costs. But rather, your cost has to do with pairs of objects in your spanning tree. It has to do with how consistent that, that spanning tree is. Um, and so, anyway, he sort of says, like, okay, maybe what I do is 
I have some piece of software that says, given a cycle, you know, just thumbs up, thumbs down, is it consistent or not? Can I find the largest spanning tree that is completely consistent inside of the graph? And that problem is empty. So, too bad. Um, but we'll see that actually, similar to like how we talked about synchronization, and maybe synchronization is empty hard, but we can come up with a relaxation that isn't, and that works pretty well in practice. Uh, we can actually do a similar thing here. So we'll talk about a complex relaxation of, of consistent method that, that in practice works quite well, which is cool. Okay, so today, and, and really, um, I guess Tuesday, we'll talk about just a sampling of methods for consistent correspondence. Notice the farther out we get in this class, the more vague our lectures get, and that's because these are open problems. These are, I can tell you what people's approaches are, but I can't tell you that they're optimal. I can just tell you that they're things that people do. And this is kind of a good inspiration for like, good research problems. These are, these are open things to think about. Yeah. Uh, in particular, we'll start with, with like, you know, approximations of that spanning tree, because that was sort of the early setup here. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about some other stuff, like inconsistent cycle detection, like can I at least sort of, you know, find cycles that are bad, and then identify them, and then fix them. Right, so how can I fix a bad cycle? I could just remove one map in that cycle, and just replace it with the composition of all the other maps. Right, and now I have a consistent cycle, 100%. Right? And so, for example, there are, there are algorithms we call cycle fixing algorithms that are exactly that. So what they do is they just they keep going through your, your graph of shapes, and they say, oh shoot, this one's bad. I'm just going to pull out an edge, replace it with a composition, and iterate. And then the question becomes, does this, this procedure converge? And with what probability does it converge to a set of consistent maps? And it turns out, um, under some assumptions, uh, this, this, this procedure will uh, give you exactly what you want. So for instance, if you assume that in any triplet of maps, only one of them can be inconsistent. Then, then you can show that, that a kind of greedy outcome that will, will work okay. So the nice part. Right, so the original context for this uh, kind of dates all the way back to registration, right? So, so a, a reasonable setup for consistent mapping might be like, I have 3D scans of a bunch of different 3D objects, and, and what I'm trying to extract is, is essentially putting them all in, in one core different frame. We already talked about this a little bit. And maybe my scans are partial, right? So only among certain pairs of these objects uh, can I actually map, and among other ones I can map. And among the pairs that I do extract to map, they might not be perfect, right? So, how can I do uh, multi-view registration given this kind of pairwise information where there's this, you know, between any two camera frames or some amount of overlap, and that's what I'm trying to leverage. Yeah, it's basic setup. So, this was the original context for consistent mapping. And what these guys propose is to say, okay, well, what do I get? Let's think about this two-dimensional example. I have this, like, white house here, right? And I have all these different camera views. And then what I get is this input uh, label B here on the right hand side. So I get just these different partial views. Yeah. And now maybe among different pairs of views, I can kind of glue them together in a reasonable way. You see that? And so what can I do? Well, I can view every, you know, one of these kind of gluing together objects as an edge in the graph. Yeah. And now for every three edges, like every three camera views, I can evaluate whether these things are consistent, right? Because what I can do is I can say I can put, you know, I can put these two in a coordinate frame, I put these two in a coordinate frame, and I can ask if those, those two coordinate frames agree with one So it will be a very simple spanning tree algorithm here. It will be I just arbitrarily choose a shape of my data set. Now I arbitrarily choose a second shape and I glue it on. And now, what do I do? I find like the next shape of my data set that agrees with that one, and I glue it in and I just did it, right? This is a good spanning tree algorithm. Um, of course, the issue with algorithms like this, and I don't think it's worth going into the details because I think people have pretty thoroughly disproven them that like, these are, these are, this is not the best way to go for these. This is very difficult. Like, there are many different spanning trees you can imagine, each one of which gives you a different core, you know, common coordinate frame for all these guys. And it's very difficult to extract a single one that's, that's exactly the best match. And to make matters worse, let's say I have one bad edge in this spanning tree. Notice that it effectively cuts my spanning tree into two pieces. Right? And those two pieces might be perfectly well aligned, but then that one bad edge is just going to take the entire stuff on the other side and put it in a bad frame. Right? And so that's what, that's what tends to happen in these techniques, that one bad match will destroy your entire collection of maps. So exactly the property that some of you want to have. So anyway, um, we're out of time. So uh, on Tuesday, we'll talk about how to fix this problem. So uh, in, in the meantime, you guys should all think about this. This is a really fascinating problem. Right? Like, given pairwise maps, how do I extract something that is consistent and still kind of low distortion makes sense. This is like a prototypical, non-convex typical problem that makes perfect sense in general.
Uh, anyway, with that, Trevor, if you can hit the button on the camera button, not turn it off or close it. Okay? And uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Your project's going to be Thursday. You do not have late days. Sign up for time to talk. If you are stuck on stuff, please, 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 please contact me. Oh my god, please.